Hello, um, I'm Raul Ochoa, and I am a dual language social science and Spanish teacher at Clifton. And um, this uh, presentation uh, is for the dual language medieval history class that I teach, and also for the uh, non dual language uh, medieval history class that I teach. So um, I'm going to just quickly uh, kind of run through um, the class overview and class expectations and um, some consequence ladder and what grades are composed of. Uh, so anyways, that's, that's kind of like what I'll be doing here. So uh, just to begin with a quick uh, little class overview here. Uh, so the idea is to um, study the social and cultural and technological changes that occurred um, really around the world, right? So, um, and this is between uh, the years 500 uh, and 1789, right? So it takes us up right up to kind of uh, the, the modern time period. And of course, we, we look at uh, events uh, that, that occurred and, and that happened and how they unfolded uh, in Europe and in Africa and Asia and, and, and definitely in the Americas as well. Uh, this is certainly a time period uh, when there is uh, growing economic interactions among civilizations and among different people. Um, and they're exchanging ideas and beliefs and technologies and goods, uh, right? So what we see is a growing interconnectedness uh, during this time period. Uh, really um, the beginnings of uh, what we now nowadays call globalization, right? Um, and of course, we also, we end uh, the, the, the course with examining uh, the Enlightenment ideas and their lasting significance, um, right? The, this age of uh, science and reason and, uh, and, and the impact uh, that, that these ideas have uh, had then in that time period and continue to have uh, now in the present. Um, we'll be working through a whole host of uh, uh, learning activities uh, throughout uh, the, the, the school year. Um, really at the core of all of this is something that I'd like for students uh, to do, right? And it's taking uh, kind of like an inquiry, uh, an inquiry based approach to the class where I want students to um, to actually do the work of uh, the, do the work that that historians do, right? And and historians uh, to begin with, they ask lots of questions, right? They ask lots and lots and lots of questions, um, and then they set out to investigate. and And usually, they investigate these. Uh, you know, they try to get to an answer uh, by um, taking a look at uh, primary uh, primary sources, right? At primary and, and of course, secondary sources, uh, you know, other historians that have written uh, things about the topic already. Um, but really, uh, historians, uh, what the analogy that I use in class and I, 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 I'm always sharing with students is that historians are, are almost like, uh, they're almost like putting puzzles together, right? And and they read one source and that's one piece of the puzzle and they read another source and that's another piece of the puzzle. Uh, and they do that over and over and over on a particular topic. And eventually the idea is to put this puzzle together and the puzzle really in our, for, for the purposes of our class and for the purposes of what historians do is, is really the story that they create, right? The narrative that they create with regards to uh, class, right? Um, with regards to that particular topic, that subject, that question that they started off with. So that's what I really want students to, um, to do uh, and to engage with that process, right? And of course, there'll be uh, lots of opportunities where I'm uh, leading class. And but in all honesty, um, students learn best when students work with each other, right? So with that in mind, research shows that uh, uh, very clearly. And with that in mind, you know, students, I will be creating, um, you know. Um, lots and lots of opportunities for students to work in pairs and small groups. Uh, and 
Of course, in our virtual setting now, uh, this means using uh, the breakout rooms, uh, which is a wonderful function that we have uh, through Zoom, right? And uh, certainly it's always important to, once uh, students receive the information and, and the teacher models it for them, uh, and then they practice it in groups, uh, it's also important for them to, to hone in on those skills, to hone in on that knowledge, uh, through some independent practice, right? And there'll definitely be opportunities for that as well. Uh, students' grades are composed of five uh, different categories. Uh, these are the categories here and their respective uh, percentages, right? So they'll be working on some DBQs uh, similar to last year uh, when they were in grade six. Um, and then they'll most certainly be working on some projects in my class. Uh, there'll be some lesson and chapter tests and quizzes, uh, and participation is important. And of course, keeping up with classwork and homework is very important as well. So um, there is a, well, I do have a late makeup work policy, which you can see here. Um, I'll quickly run through it. Uh, of course, it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, I have about 170, 180 students. Um, and um, when a student comes back, it's difficult to keep track of, oh, was, you know, the student was out yesterday or the day before yesterday or, or what have you, right? So it's always, it's always best um, when the student takes the responsibility to follow up with a teacher uh, to see what the student missed uh, in terms of assignments. Um, uh, uh, late work will receive a 10% less, uh, uh, will, be t will be deducted 10% less for each, each day that it is late. I think this is a fair policy. I know of, of, of teachers that, um, uh, that just do not take any late work, right? So I do take late work for a number of days, um, but I think that it is only fair for the students that uh, completed the assignment on time uh, for, for them to, uh, for, for, for this policy here of 10% less. Um, after five days uh, from the date that it was assigned, um, I will not be taking any late work. This is a policy that I've had for some years now. And, um, and uh, I think it's only fair uh, for uh, the student, right? It, there's an accountability piece built into that, it, making sure that we're holding them accountable to staying on top of their classwork and homework assignments. And, um, and I think it's also fair on my end where um, I won't have a student turning in an assignment that was due uh, three, four weeks before, because then it just becomes a bit of a nightmare going back into the grade book and trying to find that assignment and so on and so forth, right? So uh, also students' responsibility to reschedule, miss quizzes, tests, and presentations. Uh, classroom expectations at Clifton and in my class, we're always reaching for excellence, right? which is uh, the acronym for our core beliefs at Clifton, uh, which are respect, empathy, accountability, compassion, and hope. Um, for our dual language medieval history class, uh, communication will, uh, between students, among students, and uh, between students and teacher will always be in Spanish. And of course, this applies to the dual language medieval history class and does not apply to the non-dual language medieval history class, right? Uh, students are expected to be prepared with their classroom materials. Uh, you may find a list of suggested materials to have for this class in the class syllabus. Of course, we always expect students to be polite and respectful, and I have no doubt that they will. And um, students are expected to complete their assignments on time uh, to show their best effort and to turn in only their own original work, right? Some virtual class expectations um, right now uh, for, for the vir virtual world in which we live in now uh, for, for the time being. Of course, all of the above mentioned uh, expectations apply. Um, I would like to emphasize a couple of these points. Um, I would like to drive home the point that it is my sincere preference for all students to have their cameras on. Um, right, that is a preference of mine. And this is 
especially the case when students are working in pair and small group activities. So if you can have a nice little chat there with your child about that, I surely would uh, appreciate that. Um, and also the other point that I really would like to drive home is uh, to, to make sure that uh, your child um, is uh, minimizing their distractions and that they're focusing on uh, class uh, and not necessarily on video games or, or, or pets or distracted, being distracted with their phones. Um, and I've seen it. Uh, I've seen all of this uh, in the first two and a half weeks that uh, we've, we've been together. Um, and of course, you know, students are very uh, understanding that the minute, the minute I bring it to their attention, you know, they, they're mindful of that. And, but if you can have that conversation with them, I surely would appreciate that as well. Um, make sure that students are using the chat function on Zoom and the stream function on Google Classroom. Uh, for class purposes only, right? These are very important tools that we have, communication tools that we have, um, but it's very important that students only use them for the purposes of our classes. Uh, and the mute function on Zoom as well is important to keep track of it, um, making sure that students are uh, unmuted, uh, not muted when they are contributing to a class discussion and at all other times to have their function on mute. Um, because if not, if we have 31, 30, 35 students that were uh, uh, not on mute, that means we would have audio coming in from 30 different devices and it would make it very difficult to understand what anyone would be saying. Uh, and the last point that I have here um, for a whole host of reasons that I'm sure you and I and everyone involved understand, uh, if you can just make sure that uh, students understand uh, that uh, they are not to take any screenshots, photos, or video of classmates and or the teacher, okay? Uh, and in terms of the consequence ladder, it's pretty straightforward here. Um, right, I usually, my default is always to um, counsel the student at the very beginning, uh, right, when uh, something needs to be called to their attention, uh, and uh, give them a, a verbal or written warning, uh, and then I just kind of go from there, right? I ask the student to write a reflection about what happened. Um, I will not shy away from contacting the parent or guardian, either by email or phone. Um, and then, you know, document the incident or the behavior with a counselor or the administration or administration. And uh, lastly, um, you know, if, if the issue uh, persists, uh, then I will uh, ask if we can arrange a, a parent guardian teacher conference. Uh, and so we can get to the bottom of whatever the issue is. But in my experience, uh, in all honesty, uh, I've never really have to gone uh, much farther than the first three steps here, right? Those are usually pretty effective. Um, and, uh, and we get to the bottom of, of whatever's going on and it all works out well. So um, lastly, here is my contact information. Um, in all honesty, the best way to get a hold of me is uh, via email. You see my email address here. And of course, I'm always more than happy to arrange a phone conversation as well. Um, and we can set that up as well. And um, this is a, I do envision uh, this as being a working partnership and we're all a team, the student is part of the team. Uh, you all as uh, parents and guardians play a very important role. And of course, I, um, I always do my absolute best uh, to do my, uh, my, my job and, and the best that I can uh, in, in the classroom, right? So um, please uh, don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, I look forward to uh, a working relationship. And um, in the meantime, uh, please take good care and uh, we'll talk soon enough.
Okay. Thank you.